This episode is brought to you by Paramount Plus. If you don't already subscribe to Paramount Plus, please use our affiliate link by going to talkthroughmedia.com slash Paramount Plus. Using our affiliate link gives us a little credit, which helps us to keep bringing you great content. U.S. residents only. Hello and welcome to episode one of the Star Trek Strange New Worlds Talk Through. I'm Brian. And I'm LT. And we will be covering season one, episode one of Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Um, how would you put redundantly titled Strange New Worlds? <laughs> <laughs> um, before we get started, one um uh, podcast note um we've decided that um from a branding perspective we are going to um go and rename some of our um podcasts that that exist already and uh, we want to start that of course with new ones so we're the talk through media network we started out being you know the walking dead talk through so we're we decided that we're going to um start naming our podcasts with talk through in them so um so this will be the first of the star trek ones to fall in line with that um we're also um starting well this is not new cuz most of the podcasts are are this way um we are going to go to a three host um <laughs> you wouldn't know it from this from this uh episode but to a three host uh setup so um so for this podcast we're going to have have it with three hosts and um LT and I are two of those three and the third host um whether it's going to be Ruthie or uh, someone else we have not at this time um, determined that um, we should have that figured out by the time we do episode two in a few days. Um, but um, we just, you know, it was one of those things we hadn't figured it out yet. And we had, to, we, we said we were going to get an episode out and doggone it, we're going to do that. So um, it's just, you know, so we're, we're, going forward with this but um doing the two host thing has been a little stressful especially with my move and all of that and we think it's better going forward if we have three hosts we think it's you know even if we don't always have three hosts that do the podcast you know that week um much like we're doing this week um we think it's just easier for us uh, logistically to, to always have a show with three hosts. So we're going to do that from now on. Um, and it gives you an opportunity to say there are three hosts. <laughs> well, plus, you know, like it, it, that way, if you really don't like an episode or you're, you know, you can't make it for some reason, um, or you're, you're just, you know, for whatever reason work comes up or whatever um right. you you have two other people that you, you're not stuck you can still do the episode so th this kind of i think relieves a lot of the stress and um that we sometimes have when you only have two because when you only have two when one of the people says they can't do it the episode doesn't get done and and uh, right. um with my move I hate to say it, but that was running. We were running into that a lot with me. Um, so I think it's just easier for everybody if we just do a three host um, setup. So, and right. you know, so, so in case, in case, like with Kyle and I doing the Walking Dead talk through, that you know, I got COVID. Yes. So, <laughs> so I was I was unable to speak for a week. So. Yeah. 
that sort of put a damper on things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and we, we've run into it like on a positive way, you know, when, um, we were doing, um, um, the, uh, <laughs> I'm like blanking the stupid name of the show, um, uh, lower decks, when we were doing lower decks, you know, it, it was, um, LT Kyle and I doing it. And, um, you know, because of that, uh, if Kyle couldn't do it, the two of us did it. If, if LT couldn't do it, Kyle and I did it, you know, and, and, uh, it, so it, the show just kept going on and we didn't have to miss. And, and anyway, it just makes it easier. So we're just going to, we're going to do that from now on. And, uh, and I, I, anyway, I, I think it will make things easier for everyone. And also I think it makes for a better show. So, yeah. And see, lucky for me, since I am the eternal crash Davis of Star Trek <laughs> podcast, and I got called back up to the bigs. Yes, you to did. Do, to do a live action show this time. Yes. Yes. So and uh, I'm absolutely excited. Yeah. And uh, th- this is actually something I didn't talk to you about this, but I was, I was thinking about doing this um, with the three of us for, you know, quite a while. And, uh, you know, I was kind of like keeping it secret in my head, you know, that uh, we really should do this as, as three people. And, and, uh, you know, I just recent things came to light and I'm just like, yeah, this is, I should, I should make this more than just me in my head. I should like vocalize this. (laughs) So anyway, um, so yes. So next week, We'll have um, we'll have our our third on here, and you'll know who that is. But anyway, getting to this episode, the ultimate, or no, actually, that's not how you say it. It's the pilot <laughs> of of Star Trek: Strange New Worlds, redundantly called Strange New Worlds, as I said already. The teleplay by Akiva Goldsman, who is the co showrunner, I believe. The story by Akiva Goldsman, Ampersand, Alex Kurtzman, who is like the Rick Berman of the um, Alex Kurtzman era, <laughs> I guess you could call them, and executive producer uh, Jenny Lamette. And um, I know she is um, Sydney Lamette's is it daughter or granddaughter so. or something. And I know that she's like related to Lena Horn. So, um, so I know it was one of the songs that they played in, um, discovery was actually like, kind of like, um, I don't think we ever said it, but it was kind of like, oh, well she wrote it and it was a Lena Horn song. So, you know, it's kind of an inside like scoop thing. Anyway, um, directed by. Akiva Goldsman again. Uh, and if you didn't know, he's an Oscar award winning um, screenwriter. You didn't know, he, he wrote, um, won the Oscar for A Beautiful Mind. So, 2001. Yeah. So, okay. uh, the description from ParamountPlus.com is as follows Series premiere. When One of Pike's officers goes missing while on a secret mission for Starfleet. Pike has to come out of self-imposed exile. He must navigate how to rescue his officer while while struggling with what to do with the vision of the future he's been given. Stardate of 2259.42. It's nice to actually get a stardate. Hopefully we will continue to get them. Air date of May 5th, 2022, with the runtime of 54 minutes and 18 seconds. LT, what is your rating out of 10 for Strange New Worlds? Well, I've started off and was very pleased with what we got. So I gave it a 9.8 out of 10. No voicemail for communicators. I'm going to give it a... Hmm. I was trying to think about what, what I should give this thing. Um, 
let's see. I watched it five times. That's always a good indication that I liked it a lot. A um, couple things I kind of went, huh, on interesting choices. Mm-hmm. So I think I'll give it a 9.75. Um, 9.75 relatives to eugenics dictators or something. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, which I don't understand. Well, that's that we're going to talk about that later. Yeah, yeah, that's probably because I, sh- I, I would show my hand at this point to say that while I had no nose, I had a few not good enoughs. Yeah, yeah. We have listener ratings. We'll start off with James, the augmented sailor, who says Strange New World gets 9.9. Spock, are you naked? <laughs> and he goes on to say awesome start to the series rick from cleveland says this may be the best first episode of a star trek show ever i rate it 9.9 out of 10 that's not the lieutenant clerk you were thinking of <laughs> this was as close to a perfect episode of star trek as i have seen in a long time and i would concur and west from minnesota says Hi, everybody. I was privy to watch the first five episodes of Strange New Worlds because I wrote Picard Season 2 episode reviews for a Star Trek fan site, which I did not expect. Thanks, Paramount. Not going to spoil the other four episodes here under a strict embargo, but I give this one a solid 10 communicator beeps ignore out of 10. (laughs) All right. We have listener yeses. Yes. And since we don't have anything appropriate to this show yet, we'll just keep using our usual um, TNG era. Yes. A no, yet, not a good yes enough. from the future. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll think about it, but, uh, and I don't want to use discovery. So true. But, yeah. So yeah. we'll kick off our listener. Yeses with James, the augmented sailor. And he says virtually everything about this episode. This is Trek through and through. Intelligent, subtle, and nuanced in its politics. Didn't vilify anyone and got us back to TOS and TNG ideas. I would agree. Rick from Cleveland says so many great things this week. Yes, for Uhura, even her mannerisms felt like Nichelle Nichols while still being a new take on the character. Yes, for Christine Chapel. This take on her feels like a true expansion of the witty nurse we got so long ago. Like with Uhura, I had no trouble believing this was the same character. A huge yes for Starfleet headquarters. Pike's explanation of the seed pods was great, but I could swear that Starbase is right out of the 1975 Franz Joseph Starfleet technical manual. If only I could find my copy. (laughs) I did not look at at that, but uh, interesting. Well, just so happens, Rick, I have mine right here. (laughs) And is there anything like that in there? Oh yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yes. For TOS era props. The tricorders were just as boxy and clunky enough for the era. Yes, I noticed that definitely they were uh, they were definitely appropriate to the era. Yes, for the wonderful story. I truly love most all Star Trek, but this episode, the story hit home. It was TOS type social relevance that just makes us take a good hard look at ourselves. Are we on the brink of all that? I hope not, but boy, a lot of people need to get Pike's message here and now. I hope they do. And we've got West from Minnesota who says everything about it. I loved it. Pike channeled the future James Kirk with his blatant disregard for the prime directive and for darn good reasons. Loved it. Yeah, I agree with that. All right. Uh, LT, since my notes are 
woefully bad uh, this week. Um, what do you have for your yeses? Well, I have quite a few yeses, and I'm going to start off with the new enterprise mm-hmm. or the new old enterprise. Right. Uh, I have made no bones about it that my favorite enterprise has always been 1701, whether it was the TV version or the movie update. I really have always been a fan of the original enterprise and the way they've done it. The updates to me are just absolutely sexy. And I love them that you get round the sails with swept back struts, which I always like the swept back struts, the movie version, but I always had a, warm spot since i am a child of tos tas you know always liked my tube to sales i love the fact that they had the spinny bits on the broussards i love the fact that they had the original cage style uh hex tail uh exhaust ports yeah whatever on the the aft end of the nacelle yeah um I mean, I'm still kind of getting used to the way they did some of the hull windows, but it's a small thing at this point. Uh, It addressed some of the things that I've always thought about the original Enterprise that the, for lack of a better term, the swan neck between the, the primary hull and the secondary hull on the Strange New World version is a little shorter. I don't mind that. It Uh looks it looks racier. It looks sportier. And I'm just, I'm very pleased with the ship. So I'm sure that Eagle Moss will be taking my money as soon as I see one that I can buy. <laughs> um, I thought it was really cool that they had a motion picture style warp engine that you actually saw, uh, more than we got on the original series. Yeah. And I know that there's going to be, there's a lot of people that are already flapping their jaws about how this is not like TOS, but I am enough of a realist to realize that Gene didn't have the money in the sixties to do everything that he really wanted to do. There are some people that just, you can't make them happy. No, you Uh, can't. As, as my father used to say, there's people that would bitch if you hung them with a new rope. Well, so there's, I, 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 it just drives me bananas. It does me too, because you could not fully do the 1960s aesthetic on a modern TV show. I think that that there would be a small group of hardcore people that would be just tickled to to no end, but I think everybody else would go, this looks old, this looks phony. And so when I saw that movie style warp engine, you know, with the vertical pile that goes up towards the primary hull and the long shaft that ran backwards. I said, this is hot. I like this Yeah, because the sets are a little bit bigger and I I don't necessarily have a problem with that. Um, I think as far as the set work goes, they are very evocative of the original series. The bridge looks yes. great and it's, and it's new and it's updated and it's going to be shiny because we have much better technology to do panels and screens and things now. Yeah. You know, they're not having to go to thrift stores to get Swedish tulip chairs and put plywood <laughs> backs covered with, you know, vinyl to do deck chairs now. Um, I found myself really enjoying the uniforms because I was not so much a fan of that weird asymmetrical collar on the, the TOS looking disco uniforms. This to me strikes a very good looking, uh, compromise to the original velour shirts yeah. to something that looks very TOS, but yet it's updated. And I, I, I thought the uniforms looked really good. 
I mean, I like the fact that number one is, you know, wearing a skirt. I think that not everybody's wearing pants. I yeah. Mean, that's, yeah. I, uh, I always um, thought that the uh, uniforms for the first um, Kelvin timeline era Star Trek um, were really good. And I thought that this version is close to to that it's a little bit different maybe a little updated um but uh i I definitely thought that you know in terms of getting that similar kind of vibe um it was there you know it certainly there were there were definitely some updates like for example we see um like kyle and and uh una for example um they they had their uniforms were a little, diff- little different. They had, um, especially Una had like black along the side, and I think uh, possibly was it uh, Uhura did it as well. But you know she's wearing yeah. a cadet uniform, so it wouldn't really apply in her case. But but definitely um, Una's uniform was a little different, um, and I like that. I could you know I couldn't I couldn't see. I'll have to go back and look at it again, but Kyle's uniform reminded me of an updated engineer jumpsuit. Yeah. yeah kinda. You know, they had that little three quarter sleeve baggy wraparound overhaul kind of thing that they would wear. Yeah. And that's kind of the tone that I saw. But then again, I mean, you only saw what half of him. Because he was behind the transporter console. Yeah. But I definitely think that they've improved the uniforms for all the stuff that everybody said about, you know, the changes that we've seen in the pre-future discovery uniforms that I think this is a good modern adaptation of the original series uniform. I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. And. Yeah, to keep on going with my, you know, my giddy excitement, I'm back, I'm back on the pike wagon. Yeah. Uh, If I, if I was really digging what Anson Mount was doing in discovery, um, one episode in and I, I hate to admit it, but he's given Kirk a run for his money as my favorite captain. And that's saying a lot. Uh, I mean, I like the way he portrays the character. I like the way Anson Mount carries himself. I think that even despite the things that he had going on personally, you know, I see him as a personable captain. I see him that he's very concerned about his crew and his ship. And I just think that that's going to be a constant point with this series that Pike is the captain that everybody wants to be. Yeah. 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 And, um, you know, I recalled, you know, very, very early on, um, that, you know, upon episode one of discovery, um, you know, I was like, I want to see a show with him and, you know, it took three years, but we finally have that show and, uh, you know, probably would have taken two years if it hadn't been for COVID, but yep. But, uh, you know, we finally got it and I am happy that it's here. I am too. Yeah. And I see I also, all the possibilities that I, yeah. you know, thought were, um, there. And I think, and I think we're going to get, I, I just have a feeling we're going to get the best of both worlds in this that i think we're going to get some long spanning character arcs but yeah. we're going to get the episodic adventure of the week stuff that everybody complained that they weren't getting with discovery so uh i think i think that they've had enough time they've you know talked to enough focus groups I think they have the right set of actors together. So I'm, I'm excited for what's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, to me, 
it's what I can see it being is kind of like, um, you know, an ER or Grey's Anatomy or an NYPD Blue. Uh, when it comes to like episodic, you know, the the situation yeah. or situations of the week, um, but you know, along that there there are continuing you know character arcs that that uh, take you along as you go and and to me that's the way you do um you know episodic tv these days it's not you know like we used to say procedural well they're not procedural this is not procedural this is you know a self-contained story with you know maybe the story takes um, a certain thing that one character is going through and it plays upon it or maybe more than one um, or, you know, whatever's going on with their character is part of a B or a C plot. So, yeah. And I think, I think we're going to have the opportunity to do one of the things that people had said about TOS that, different people have said over the years that, well, we got development for say Chekhov that we found out things about Chekhov. If it was a more Chekhov centric episode, but for the most part, he was sitting in the chair saying a captain and pushing buttons. But I think what we're going to get is a little bit of that. Plus we're going to get a little extra information on the primary set of characters. And I think that's going to be a, a perfect way to roll with it. Yeah. And after I had, I had, you know, jumped up and down about Pike so much, I was really excited to see the, uh, actor that they've got playing nurse chapel. And I will put it this way that for, she was in, you know, sick bay for, many, many episodes. And we found out things about her because of her interactions with McCoy. And because she actually did have a few episodes where she was, you know, maybe the B character. And I think this is going to add a little backstory to that of how she became, um, bones girl Friday. Yeah. And I think it's going to, I'm kind of excited to it. And I, I, I liked the way that the actress did her thing with Dr. Mbenga. Yeah. I just, I, I'm just thinking that that's going to work out really well. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, uh, since you mentioned that I, I'm going to just kind of go into something that I could say for, uh, a yes and and that would be um you know the the whole play with with her and uh, you know like her personality uh really showed out showed up in in this episode and you know mm-hmm. her um i liked how you know she you know ran after that guy and the what was it the i forget the name of the 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 maneuver or whatever it was um sc- Scorpi, was it something Scorpi, something like that. anyway, um, and it seemed like a lot of them knew what that was. Like, um, what's her name? Ortegas seemed to know what that was, right? Um, but but anyway, um, I liked you know obviously Mabenga and uh, Chapel have have a a. Uh, a long standing working relationship. Um, you know, he calls her his favorite and, uh, they, they've obviously got it. They're, they're obviously really work well together. Um, I liked her, um, her personality. Um, I liked when, um, her reaction to, uh, you know, Nguyen Singh when she, um, you know, didn't want the, the right. Uh, didn't want to take the shot. Didn't want to take the shot. Um, and when, you know, she's asked like, you know, does it, does it always work or whatever? And I think, she, what did she say? It 
can't remember the exact response, but um, I liked how she said it. I liked, um, you know, how she, you know, got into um, the whole thing to to get the uh, salve to to Spock and and how that all played out. Um, I thought all all that was great teamwork and and even um, um, Uhura, you know, getting um, like disarming the guy, you know, making him feel comfortable and that. I thought that was really good, and I I think. Um, someone mentioned how Uhura was, and and um, anyway, so I didn't mean to steal the, your thunder here, well, but fine. but yeah, uh, yeah. it just all kind of fit. I really liked um, this character, and and the like you said, the the actress who who plays her. Um, I didn't really know her from anything. Um, I have something I I brought up before we started recording that I'll bring up later that the nitpickers will probably go crazy over. Um, but still, I anyway, I thought she is a um, pleasant surprise. So, Yeah, and I think just to go a little further off of something you said, the one thing that I've noticed is this crew seems far more comfortable with each other now that you – in the we talked about it in season one season two of discovery that everybody was still kind of getting used to each other and there was not always all the real smoothness between the crew like you see now in season four discovery and they're starting off with that i think you can tell that this is an experienced crew they work together even though uh, chapel may be new to the enterprise she's not new to the dock they they seem to work well together you see a lot of really not forced not questioning type things with the bridge crew so i'm excited to see how all that pans out yeah it's like um the the crewmates even if they've not worked on the enterprise together they seem to have worked together in the past like well you know certainly um spock and number one have worked with pike but um you know he knows dr mapenga maybe not necessarily from the enterprise but he knows him um and and he and mapenga knows uh uh chapel and they both seem to know um Nunyan singh and you know so there's, there's a whole you know uh, it's it seemed to me that they've they've managed to pull off a level of uh you know comfort with each other that we i don't think we've seen previously and i would say that some of that you know like discovery didn't have i think because of lorca you know um yeah because lorca didn't um, inspire that in his crew. He inspired, you know, working together by threats and, and, uh, you know, he was a, a different kind of captain. <laughs> well, as everyone has said, the commander of a unit kind of sets the tone for right. the people that work for him. And if your captain is, you know, confident and your captain is, I don't want to say smooth, but if your captain is, you know, confident, well rehearsed, not super authoritarian, not always cracking the whip, then you can get to that point where everybody knows their job, they work at it well, they can talk to each other and it and it all comes to a, you know, smoother, more efficient kind of thing. Right. Well, for another yes, I had to throw it in there. <laughs> Lieutenant Kirk, Sam, not Jim, and his mustache. Yeah, that was kind of a surprise for me. I, I wasn't seeing um, Samuel Kirk um, showing up here, but uh, you know, well, everybody was going. Everybody, as soon as they heard Lieutenant Kirk, you know, they were like, "Oh no, oh no!" <laughs> Jim Jim Kirk was on the Farragut. That yeah. can't be. <laughs> and then then it's like. 
it's Sam. Yeah. It's his brother. And the fact that he was sporting that lovely, lovely mustache. And as a mustachioed Star Trek fan, I'm going, yes, we have a crewman with a mustache. (laughs) Yep. And I guess the last thing I'm throwing out is as much as we love to bash it, as much as we love to break it, the whole thing they did with going from general order one, which we have heard, yeah, which, you know, started off in TOS as general order one. And then later it started becoming the prime directive. Right. And And Pike says, Oh, that'll never stay. (laughs) Yeah. I love that. (laughs) And I'm going, Oh, Chris, if you only knew, but that, that to me was another one of those very, I think it was subtle the way they slid it in and they acknowledged the fact that the prime directive is a rule it's aspirational and it's an aspiration that we don't always meet, but we try, we try really hard. Yes, definitely. Um, all right. Well, I wrote down some yeses while, while we were talking, um, I liked that um, we saw like one, one thing we, we tend to see a lot of are um, we see these, you know, shiny uh, spacecraft that, you know, don't look like they're um, used, you know, that, that they're uh, spit and polish. And we definitely did not see that with uh, uh, Admiral April's uh, shuttlecraft. It looked like it had uh, uh, needed a, a uh, a car wash you know <laughs> you needed a wash of wax and details yeah it, it it looked like um you know a a a car in the middle of winter that has all the salt deposits on it and uh um reminded me of you know uh growing up in in uh ontario uh in the middle of winter and seeing um the the cars and how awful they get uh anyway all all scuffied up and you know because it wasn't just dirt it, you know you saw these like um look like grooves of of the uh, duranium or whatever the well, shuttle's made of you know i figure that in i figured that that's not you know that's not necessarily his shuttle that's kind of like the the pool shuttle that you get when you know yours is out of service it's the loner shuttle. Yeah. 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 And True. just, just a quick, you know, interjection about that. It's not quite like a original TOS shuttle, but right. it's definitely got more of the TOS vibe than the, the discovery ones than the disco ones. Yeah. Yeah. So for sure. to me, it was the, it was just about the right blend of, original aesthetic with some update yeah because you've got to admit as much as we love it the tos shuttle was pretty much just a box it was pretty you know it was angular it was functional but this has more detail it's got a little more a little more pizzazz right um Spock and to Pring. So um, I think it's probably appropriate that we see that whole relationship in, in this, in this, um, in the series, because we know where that's going. Um, and there's a, there's a title coming up. I think it's called Spock Amok. So yep. I'm thinking that that probably has to do with uh, to pring and, uh, you know, that whole, that whole thing. Um, cause you know, that, that episode was of course, um, uh, a muck time, right? That was a muck yep. time. So when it was, when it was pun var season, right? So this is probably a pun, a pun far, uh, episode that's coming up. Um, this is the first, time that we're ever hearing of a warp bomb but to me um this does not surprise me um because to me it, it would 
there would be the potential for destruction there. Um, so I thought that it was uh, an interesting use of the um, technology. So, yeah, and and it goes to figure that anytime you know, anytime you have something that can create energy, it has a light a likewise effect of being a good explosive right yeah i mean you're you're talking about like matter and antimatter um and all the collisions so um you know warp bubble or not of course you could make a bomb out of it um so yeah. it it makes sense um i liked pike's um chambers you know so his uh it, it looked very homey. Um, I liked how it had wood in there. You could definitely see he's got a um, um, place to cook in there. So, you know, it's kind of. He's definitely got better digs than Kurt did. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, which uh, makes you wonder. It's like, well, why didn't Kirk have the, those digs? But, and speaking they were of re- that. They were, re- they were remodeling that section of the uh, crew quarters. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of that, the uh, Pike's um, um, cabin there reminded me of the cabin that we see Kirk have in Star Trek generations. Mm-hmm. It, it reminded me of that like very closely. Uh, I don't, I wouldn't say it was an exactly the same one but it, it just reminded me of that i'm curious about this um captain patel and what her deal is um you know it sounds like they're you know obviously like dating but not you know too seriously at this point but i'm right. i'm wondering you know if she's got a a higher security clearance than he does uh, what does she do? You know, what, what's her what kind of command is she commanding right now? So I wondered that, um, hopefully they'll tell us later. I'm hoping so. Um, what else? I was just generally, um, happy with, with the episode. I, I guess the, the other thing that I didn't mention yet that I should is, um, I liked the aliens, um, was it Kylie two seven nine. Um, you know, they, yep. they seemed very earth like, um, you know, uh, they acted very, you know, human like, uh, they, you know, I could see humans acting the same way in a lot of ways. Um, I like, you know, the cool buildings that they had, um, I think I've seen buildings like that, but you know, not exactly the same. Um, but uh, what else can I say? Well, I think one of the things that we have to acknowledge is while it is to me, it's sort of an unconscious nod to all the other aliens we got in previous series that were basically humans with an appliance to have bumpy heads and spots. I like the makeup. Speaking of that, yes. Um, the the use of, you know, um, Nurse Chapel coming in there to apply the, you know, it explains like, hey, we're, you know, this is a new program to prevent cultural contamination. So I'm guessing they didn't do that kind of thing before, or this is kind of a new thing. So, um, you know, and obviously they've gotten better at it by the time TNG comes, mm-hmm. you know, but, um, I thought that was interesting and, uh, I liked, I liked seeing him do this, uh, that way. And, um, it, it just, it made sense to me. Um, it's the thing we can do now, right? We have the special effects capacity to actually do that on camera as opposed to he had a special surgical procedure 
and here he is now. <sighs> right. Yeah. All right. So now that we've gone through our yeses, now it is time for our noes. No! <laughs> still appropriate though if you think about it because uh it's picard who is in a mind meld with sarek with sarek who is spock's dad so it's appropriate who is still alive who is still alive yes so there you go yes james the augmented sailor says the archer was only manned by a crew of three that looked almost like a California class vessel. I seriously doubt they could get away with just having three people on board to run it. It's a nitpick, but it's still a no. And I have to agree with you on that one. It was very odd. Um, it seemed just too big of a ship to only have three people on it. And I took the contravening argument and took it as it was just the landing party. Hmm. I mean, it's possible, except that that's not what they said, you know, but who, who can say really, I just know what the voice is in my head. Told. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our next no is from West from Minnesota, who says, I did not find any faults with this episode. Ergo, I have no nose. Yes. The no is that he has no nose. Anyway, LT, do you have any nose? Well, I, I must concur with Wes in that I have no nose. Well, I have a nose, but I have, <laughs> I have no negative. I have no negatives on this episode. Well, I've got some not good. Like I said, I've got some not good enoughs, but I have no. There are no hard nose for me this time. I don't have any hard nose either. Um, I have one that I put in the nose just because I didn't really want to put it in the not good enough because to me, a not good enough would indicate um, something that was a problem with the episode or, or made me, I don't know, shake my head or whatever. This right. was not that. Um, this was more of a, uh, uh, shaking my head at the fans. Okay. So, so I am, um, you know, shaking my fist at you nitpicking, Brian, me, me, what did I do to you? Shut up. Okay. Actually <laughs> back into your corner. Nitpicking, Brian. <laughs> um, I was really getting annoyed. Uh, online um when i was like going through facebook um um groups and and that and reading some of the uh responses going to like the um the star trek uh on paramount plus fake facebook page mm -hmm. um and reading some of the responses to that and just we were talking about this before we started recording there are just some people they just, they just never, ever going to be happy. It's like their, their sole purpose in life is to be a sourpuss. You know, it's like you, you, you know, that they've been uh, getting their Star Trek here for five years now. And, you know, they've been whining about discovery and, you know, then they say, well, we want Picard. Then we give him Picard. Oh no, we don't want that Picard. You know, we, we want, um, we want something like, you know, TNG. Well, how about lower decks? Oh, that's, you know, that that's, uh, animated. That's, you know, that's it's not serious. Yeah. It's a cartoon. It's not serious enough. Um, what we want is old time Star Trek. Okay. Well, here's, strange new worlds and you know it's episodic and it's just like you know tos in a lot of ways and you know but updated to the times and it's like well no what do they got a nitpick about so i i saw someone nitpicking about it takes longer than 18 hours to get for spock to get from vulcan to earth and it's like are you freaking kidding me 
you're nitpicking about the show because of that. Like what the F what, what is your problem, dude? Like you, you're going to start nitpicking about like, and like, you know, you could, you could see by the way he was like, it wasn't just him. Okay. There were mo- multiple people that were, you know, proverbial, proverbially throwing their papers in the, in the air going, ah, stupid new track, you know? And, and it's just like, man, I, I don't know. It's probably the same people that, you know, were up in arms about Star Wars coming back and, and, you know, it not being, um, the, the same or being too much of the same. And it's just like, Oh God, yeah. I, I just, uh, I can't stand people sometimes it's like, they try to look for reasons not to enjoy things that are good. And it's, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to love everything. Okay. You know, if if you don't love, um, prodigy, for example, I get that. Okay. It's, it's different. It's different. Um, it's for kids. It's, um, you know, if if you don't like lower decks, I get, get that too it's animated it's you know it's very irreverent it's it's funny it's funny if you you know if you don't have a sense of humor you probably won't like it very much okay but um i don't know i i have a tendency i i love the universe i love everything that's in the universe there isn't a, a star trek that i've come across yet that i disliked um, some of them I've liked more than others. Um, right. Some of them, you know, have had issues sticking the landing <laughs> that we'll probably talk about, uh, sooner yep. or later. Um, but, and, or I've already talked about, but I still, it's like pizza, right? It's like, I love pizza. Some pizzas are better than others. But I still love pizza and I still love to eat it. And if you say, hey, Brian, here's some pizza, I'm probably going to enjoy it. And it's just like Star Trek. I'm going to enjoy it. You know, it's it. And this to me, this is exactly what I had hoped it would would be. I mean, is it exactly exactly what I thought it would be? Mm, Maybe not. I don't know. I have to think about that a little bit. But but um pretty darn close i mean but what but what is yeah exactly exactly and and to crawl up on my soapbox for a second the one thing that the modern era has brought us you know with the democratization of social media so that it's not just the magazine the comic book the back in the days when I was younger and a fan and you would get your information from Starlog or one of the science fiction magazines you'd pick up and to get real opinions like we're seeing now everywhere, you would go to a convention. So they would be little clusters of fans face to face who you would get your nitpickers and point pointers and people that would argue about canon from episode to episode and things about well so and so was wearing this color uniform in this episode and he was wearing this color uniform and that you know or scotty did this with his hand on one episode and he did that with his hand on this other episode but you you kind of had to be there to be with the people to hear that and now you know any disaffected tom dick or harry with a with a Twitter account can get up and rant and rave. And it seems bigger than it is when all of us can get on to the forum at star trek.com and rant and rave in real time. And there are other people who agree with us. And so we get immediate validation of our opinion, but it doesn't necessarily make it right that yeah yes there are there are things about the shows that i disagree with in one way or another right but it still goes back to 
you're trying to canonize things from a TV show made in the 60s that lasted three seasons that nobody expected was going to do what it did. Right. The analogy would be is if 20 years later they made a movie from, you know, the the sitcom my mom the car <laughs> and it suddenly became a phenomenon and turned into spin-off series and books and novels and everything else you're still talking about what and i'm trying to remember how many episodes but you're still talking about say 60 70 if that much episodes of a TV show that was never intended to be canonically correct, even right. amongst itself. If you're talking about star Trek, you're talking about 79, 79. I knew it was, I, I wanted to say 72, 79. Yeah. It was somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah. Not, not including, I, th- I believe it's 79, not including the cage or including yeah. the cage. Yeah. I think that might be. Yeah. But anyway, my point is if, this is the way you're wired and you get your enjoyment from trying to find things the writers missed, then more power to you. But if you're going to enjoy something, you know, sit back and enjoy it. Um, you could say the same thing about people arguing about how many retcons they've done in the Batman movies. Uh, there's fodder for it in star Trek, uh, to, you know, invoke, what our mutual acquaintance Larry Nemechek said, you know, all all praise be to Larry. Um he said that canon is canon is not necessarily the you know it's not the Bible, it's guardrails. It's there to just keep you going in the right direction. And I I'm to the point where I can't get so absolutely hung up when I'm actually enjoying the show. And you've known, you've known it. We've, as we podcast together, I'll find something to say this didn't work or this wasn't right, but it doesn't mean I don't love the show. I mean, I I will, I will go to the carpet and I've done it with several acquaintances of mine who want to argue about, you know, discovery. Right. And I, you know, I love it warts and all Mm -hmm. that there are things about it that annoy me. There are things about it I don't necessarily like, but as a whole, I can sit down and enjoy the TV show without going into that macro level of detail. I'm far, I'm far harsher watching, you know, fire, fire department shows and cop shows (laughs) as far as things like that go, because you know, that's real freaking life, right? But it's TV. Yeah. They have to make it, they have to make it, you know, they have to do stupid things and things that you got to scratch your head and beat your forehead with because it's a TV show. You have yeah. to make it, you have to make it interesting. Right. Yeah, I agree. So I'm off the soapbox. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, anyway, my, my point, I think has been well made here that if the only thing that I can say negative about it, other than um, I, I will agree with what James said about the um, uh, about the USS Archer. I yep. did find it. I did find it hard to believe that it had a crew complement of only three. Like unless that ship was, you know, was basically the equivalent of a runabout um but looked like a you know a, a standard starship or you know a small um a small right. starship um having a crew complement of 3 didn't make any sense and you know especially when two of them are astrophysicists you know it's like well what the hell are they doing down there like w- yeah. what's the it, at a, anyway who's going to drive who's going to change the spark plugs exactly you know unless they're astrophysicists and you know multidisciplinary um you know they, they have one that mind, just they finished mind, their 
one minor had, in engineering. <laughs> exactly. And one had a one had a minor in, in security and the other one had a minor in engineering and you know, um yeah, that that was uh I had a hard problem a uh, hard time with that, but it, it's it was minor, you know. Yep. All right. Okay, so let's move on. And this is a difficult question. It's like, which one is it? Is it hold your horses or is it not good enough? I'm going to play both. Hello, this is Captain Tilly. What the heck? He hell. What the hell? Hold your horses. Why can I play that? Well, A, I love it. And B, it's the same era. So. Not good enough, damn it. Not good enough. And I can play that because it's from an all-time classic episode, Yesterday's Enterprise, I Rest My Case. So we'll, we'll play them both until we decide which one to play or maybe come up with something else for this show. Who knows? Because maybe, maybe they'll give us a good sounder we can use. Yep. All right. So, well, you? Let's, let's kick off our not good enough with James, the augmented sailor. And he says, I thought Vulcans only made it during Ponvar. I've never known them to be sexual beings outside of that. At least not that I can recall. Yep. And yeah. And he says, I thought Sam Kirk was a research scientist in Operation Annihilate. Did they say he was actually in Starfleet and TOS? Well, I say that this is before then. So. Who knows? Yeah, I I don't know. Um, it's maybe been a long got time out. since I've seen it. So maybe he got out. He was in Starfleet. He got out and then decided to be a government contractor to make more money. There you go. Oh wait, they don't. Well, anyway, forgot, <laughs> they don't make money. <laughs> Gold press latinum. <laughs> it's all about the latinum. Yeah. Yeah. Rick from Cleveland says, just one hold your horses for me. And oddly enough, it's with Pike. Now, maybe it's because for the viewer, his revealed future was three years ago, but it felt as though he was able to function, inspire, and kick ass for a couple of episodes of Discovery Season 2 after that. I hope this is not something he dwells on because the Pike in the cold open was very out of character. Here's what I would say in in that case. Um, think adrenaline. Um, like when when a when someone is like in a stressful situation and they've got uh, adrenaline and they're you know not resting and they're continuing to go and um, you know they go they go they go and then finally they rest and suddenly they poop out. And to me, this is what happened with um, Pike here. He, you know, after things finally settled down, um, the enormity of what he has uh, just, you know, witnessed probably uh, hit him harder. And um, yeah, that, that's what what I'm thinking. This, you know, it's kind of like in, in a lot of ways. Um, I think Pike is kind of experiencing his own grief process and um this is kind of a stage yeah i was gonna say that just from my experience when you're in the moment and you're doing the job you can compartmentalize some yeah. of those things and you focus on what you have to do exactly and i would relate it to almost it's not PTSD. Well, it is PTSD. It's almost pre-traumatic -tra stress disorder. Yeah. That when you get that point in your career, especially if it's a career that, you know, as mine what have been in certain sections, when you have those quiet moments of reflection, sometimes they can eat you alive. Mm -hmm. And then getting back you know, getting back in the saddle to use a pike analogy that once you get back in the, in the job and you start working and your brain kicks back over into work mode, then you can tamp that stuff down. Yeah. And some people are better at it than others, but I would say that, yeah, when he had time to take a break and he had some downtime 
to just sit there and not have anything to think about, but what he's thinking about. Yeah. I could see that it would eat him up, but once he gets back in the center seat and starts commanding his ship, then it's probably easier for him to, you know, compartmentalize those thoughts and do what he's got to do. Yeah. And I think to, um, you know, not only compartmentalize, but, um, kind of being on the job, he kind of processes it a little bit better. You know, he can kind of realize that, okay, you know, this is how I deal with it. And, um, but yeah, I I mean, he's in, in Montana, he's, he's just like, he's psyching himself out, uh, per se. And, Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, that, that's what, what I see. And yep. As, as someone who's psyched himself out before I can, um, understand that. So, so the last one up is West from Minnesota. who says not good enough or hold your horses. Don't know which one we're, we've got you covered. We have you covered West. <laughs> he says the shock value Pike gave to that assembly about a second civil war and the third world war shock value. I love that, but it was too brief, mm, too brief. See, I was going to say this in my uh, yeses that I, I love that they went there with it, um, but I don't know if I'd say it was too brief because, I mean, how much of that think, did you want to see? I think it was, I think it was, it was just the right tone because if you want to pick that net, uh, what year did Khan Noonien sing supposedly go to space well yeah see that that's that whole thing is supposed to be 1996 but 1997 so yeah okay it's it's still the fact of modern time creeps on and when you're in the 60s and you pick something in the future to be your future date yeah this is kind of what happens when you have a series that's been going for 50 plus years yeah Definitely. The few the future keeps getting having to shove forward. Oh, and the nitpickers were cr- uh complaining about that too, by the way. Complaining well, of about course that. they were. Of course they were. LT, what do you have for your not good enough slash hold your horses? Well, the for starters, and I forgot to write it down, but I'm gonna say it anyway. So who takes care of the horses in Montana when both the captains are off captaining. <laughs> Do I, they have a groundskeeper? Maybe they're holographic horses. <laughs> I don't know. I wow. I, I it just that that was you said where my head went because I'm going. Well, if she's gone and he leaves, you know, did he lock the door? Did they, you know? <laughs> What about the stuff in the fridge? I mean, <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe that's like an Airbnb uh, ranch or something. You know, who knows? Yeah. Uh, the next thing that I brought up was while we were talking about Pike's Cabin, um, a fireplace. Okay. Well, I not was, only that, was, he was he was making uh, pancakes and you know. Well, I, I don't have a problem with him cooking in his cabin, but the, the open flame sort of seems to be, well, perhaps they don't have such an oxygen rich atmosphere, but I could kind of see where that would be a, a, a little bit of an OSHA violation. <laughs> you know, they tend, they tend to frown on open flames and aircraft these days. Yeah. Uh, just kind of seemed to me it's like well that's really nice and homey but um i really hope that's like a holographic fire yeah probably is probably is oh so okay so i didn't get this at first you're not talking about his um cabin in montana you're talking about no. his, you're talking about the enterprise cabin. Enterprise cabin yes okay yes yeah, said, and, and we see what? we'd seen um fire like this on Discovery too. Um they had like that bar, they yeah. had they had some so it's gotta be holographic. It has to be. Well, it just like I said, 
just me being the safety nerd. I'm kind of going, yeah, that's bad. <laughs> it is bad. Um, so my next, not good enough was just, uh, you know, shirtless Spock. <laughs> and I, I guess after, after the time from COVID working at home, I'm like, you're answering a zoom call Spock, put a shirt on for God's sake. <laughs> and I'm sure that everybody's really glad to see Ethan's pecs, <laughs> but, um, I was just like, okay. You know, surprised that wasn't someone's ratings. Yeah. You know, it's like, couldn't you just have like not answered the call and had enough time to get dressed since you were engaging in your not so Vulcan make out session with your soon to be wife. Mm. Of course I added, I added the other part of my big fat Vulcan wedding <laughs> because I just wonder, you know, when we had a muck time, we had the little guys with the helmets and the little you right. know, bell dingy things. And right. I just, after she gave him the necklace and they went back, to the room to Cahoozle, I just kind of was going, well, I don't know. You know, like James said, I didn't think it was pond far season. He wasn't acting all pond fari. Yeah. But I can always throw the excuse of, well, you know, he is half human. And we kind of know well, what all the, we, we know what the human dudes would be thinking. <laughs> but then again, uh, to Pring's, should be more Vulcan y, maybe, but yeah, I don't definitely. know. I don't know. We'll see. Um, like I said, it's just a it's just a slight horse hold on that one. The whole uh, query neck, response thing. Um that that was kind of odd. It was odd. Yeah. So, so we'll we'll just chalk that whole thing up to okay. Um, my next thing was Gorns. Yeah. And we've already, we've already invoked the, the, uh, the picking of nits here, but was it not in arena that they said they've never run into the Gorns until now? And that's, that's what, what I thought. That's like six years in the future. Mm -hmm. Even though, as someone mentioned, Lorca had the Gorn skeleton in his office, right? It just seemed to me to be one of those, wait a minute. How do we know they were Gorns? Right. Just because they were Gorn skeletons doesn't mean that they knew that they were Gorn. Those were Gorns. Well, right. well that, that's, that's it's like just, how, you know, in, in, on, um, in enterprise, they ran into Ferengi and they ran into the Borg and they didn't know either one at the time. So, right. So my next one is explain to me how they shot the serum update into spot when he was at the eye scanner. Yeah. They transported the contents of the vial into his eyeball when he was and of course it had to be eyeballs, not quite, not quite needles, but still vague eye trauma. Thanks Kurtzman. Um, that reminded me of something. Um, what was it? I was watching that had eye trauma in it. Um, was it on walking dead or fear the walking dead? They've had a couple. Yeah, they've that, had a couple. They've had a couple of knives and eyeballs the last couple of. Oh, no, 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 no. I know what it was. It wasn't that. It was, um, I believe I want to say it was um, the the new show um, on Paramount Plus. Um, Halo? Halo. I think Halo had, yes. had an yes. eye trauma. Yes, they did. Yes. Yeah. I'm catching up on that now. As uh, I'm... I'm going i'm i'm very hot and cold on that mm. i love it i hate it i love it i hate it and it's i'm still leaning towards the love side of the spectrum but yeah 
that's a that's a whole nother mythos that people are arguing over. Mm. So back to my not good horses. Um, <laughs> I'm still waiting for them to give me a good explanation of uh, Lieutenant Noonien saying there because I, I keep thinking, you know, is she an augment? Is this going to be some kind of thing? Or is this just they picked the name out of the hat to make everybody ask questions? I really wondered that myself because um, I wasn't. There, there were certain parts of that explanation that were well explained and certain parts of it that were not um, like, you know, they, they, they talked a lot about, you know, how she was, um, you know, kind of set, set yeah. away um, how, you know, her family or who her, you know, the people she was with, whatever, um, how, you know, they, um, slaughtered them and, you know, the, the look of surprise on their faces and how she didn't have that and all of that. I, I found all of that was very interesting. Um, but I didn't understand why she's a Noonien Singh and how, just like you said, it's like, I, I don't, I don't understand a lot of what happened there is she an augment is she something else um i mean do they not know that name you know is it one of those pieces of history that they say is so poorly documented you know right because technically they shouldn't know Mm. that there might be something historically but you know khan didn't get found until again six seven years from now right unless they're going to say there was another ship full of uh, people that was not the same it was the same bunch of folks but not the same bunch of folks right um i'm just hoping that i get a more satisfactory answer at some point yeah i would agree with that um it's it, it's it, there it's like i said part of it is is vague and part of it is detailed and the parts that are detailed are parts that I didn't really care about. And the parts that are vague are the parts that I cared parts about. Like, I care it's about. like, what, right. What's her deal. And it's, it's like, okay, you explained, um, how, you know, how she ended up where she is. It's like, okay, great. Well, why is she there? You know, like who, who is she? Not right. how did she get there, but who is she? Is she me, a r- relative of, you know, is she a descendant? Is she like his daughter? Uh, you know, <laughs> what, what's the deal? Yeah. It's kind of the thing where you wake up in the morning and there's a Buick in your living room and they tell you where the tires were bought and <laughs> who owns the car but they don't really tell you how the Buick ended up in your living room. (laughs) That's a good way to put it. Yeah. I mean, uh, great that you're telling me all this stuff about the car, but I kind of want to know why the car is here. Um, the last thing I've got for, uh, not good enough was okay. So when April shows up, he's referred to as Admiral Admiral. Now, according to memory alpha, he was a Commodore when he retired. Mm-hmm. So did that mean he did something naughty and got busted because Commodore is below Admiral. It most certainly is. So I'm kind of thinking, well, you know, just how bad did he get called on the carpet because of this, this, uh, prime directive violation, which I don't think they said he got busted, but you know, I'm thinking who knows mm-hmm. again, it's, it's a little, it's a little nitpicky thing, but as I've said on many occasions in my world, rank matters. Well, and, and there's a, di- and, and like I said, there's a difference between being a captain, a fleet captain, a Commodore and an admiral. Right. It's like, they're not synonymous. They're not interchangeable. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and 
is there any admiral that is at the same level as a commodore or is a is um is that one st- the the lowest admiral is that one step up from a commodore well if you look at it from the classical perspective I want to say in the Navy, you were a Commodore if you were the, a senior captain that was put in charge of a detachment. So if there was a separated squadron and you were the senior most captain, you were breveted Commodore to show that you were in charge. Now, the British Navy actually has a rank of Commodore. Right. Right. And the American Navy got rid of Commodores and they became rear admirals. Okay. That's what I was thinking of. But the progression is a Commodore is a flag officer like an admiral, but it's basically the, the bottom of the chain. That's, that's what I was thinking of though, was rear admiral. Yeah. So, and fleet captain is just below that. Yeah. The way, the way I understood it for Star Trek purposes is fleet captain is still the, again, the sort of analogous to you are the senior most captain in charge of a group of ships or a unit that doesn't rate having a flag officer. So if you were the, if you were the most senior captain, you would, you could be or it may be a fixed rank in Star Trek. Um, I, I think yeah. it may be, but the idea is, is that you're not an admiral yet, but you're senior enough that you can command other captains. Sounds like Picard. You, you would think that, you know, in his day, he would have been a fleet captain or, or something like that, but they never made him as such. Like I'm thinking, um, like in the battle of, um, not battle, but when, um, they're patrolling the, the, uh, Klingon border there in season five of TNG, um, right? you know, he was like the senior captain there. You would think he would get like a field commission of, uh, of, you know, fleet captain there or, or something. But maybe by then they got rid of that. They well, just- and that's kind of what I'm thinking is that I think they did it. I think the first time you heard about a fleet captain was with Garth of Izar, I believe. Yeah. And I think they did that just as a distinction in the writing to show that he was a senior captain. Yeah. But while while there were lots of world war two vets that were writers in the original series, I think they still played a little fast and loose with ranks. So yeah, there is that. Um, okay. So as far as my not good enough, um, I think we basically covered them already. Um, like my, my main thing would be, um, the um you know the whole thing with Nunyan saying um right and like we both said it just makes me wonder how they're gonna tie that one up yeah um and um oh okay so i don't know the answer to this I, i'm sure that it's something but they said something about um, the was it, um, the planet Salon or Salon. Um, the oceans were made of liquid mercury, which um, that's not a place you'd want to go to. <laughs> That'd be bad. No, that would be bad. Um, be very very bad. Earths are water, but they never said what what Vulcan's um, oceans were. And it made it sound like they weren't of water. So what are they of? Sand. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) How would that work? You'd have to have something like stirring them around or something. (laughs) 
Well, I mean, it's hot and right, we know right. that Vulcan is hot and arid. Right. That's true. So yeah. maybe they have, maybe they have like the dead sea. Maybe it's just brackish, very salty. Well, yeah, that could be. Oh, well, I guess, I guess we need our, uh, our stellar cartographer to come in our geophysics officer. Yeah. It, anyway, it would have been nice to have, uh, have gotten some kind of explanation of that. And, um, I guess to Pring didn't seem all that Vulcan to me. She seemed pretty progressive, which to me later, um, you know, in the future, she seems very Vulcanish, you know? So, um, well, maybe she's young. She just got out of the Academy. <laughs> you know, she's been, she's been following some indie rock band around Vulcan. <laughs> that's good that's a good one i, I just uh, you know because everybody always says that you know when you're young you tend to be more you know you tend to be more liberal and carefree and as you get older you tend to get more conservative so who very knows? true very true all right, so let's move on to our feedback section and open hailing frequencies. Okay, so we've got some uh, voicemail. Um, well, specifically one, and it's from Jeff X Force Eleven in your neck of the woods, keeping the streak alive. Keeping the streak alive. Hello, Star Trek fans. It's Jeff X Force 11 as we begin a brand new series Star Trek Strange New Worlds, with the title of the first episode being the same. It was interesting to put myself back in our character's shoes because it has been a good while since we met with Pike and Spock and Una. And this was very interesting. I am going to like this crew. I think they have built a rich crew of characters, and I am just intrigued. Nurse Chapel looks very cool. I'm just intrigued by all of the characters and the story that they're going to tell. And yes, it was a little ham-handed of reaching out and proving Pike's worth here with this civilization that developed warp as a bomb. And I think it was a little forced, but I liked it because it was in contrast to what we just saw on Picard of that civilization on Earth getting ready to go into wars and this being on the other side of it. And I really am going to look forward to this going forward. And I think maybe it could have been stretched out a, bit, a little bit longer, maybe splitting it out into two episodes. But honestly, I'm just ready for this ride and can't wait to see what's next. All right. Those are my thoughts. X-Force is out. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, X-Force 11, for your feedback once again. And uh, who knows if this will actually happen, but from his uh, feedback that he gave on the, um, on the Facebook group, it sounds like the streak is about to end. Oh, no. What, what, what? Yes, supposedly um, he will not be available for a couple of weeks, so he may not give us feedback for um, a couple of weeks. He'll be behind. So I was I was shocked, shocked. I say when I heard that. Um, hopefully, somehow you'll you'll get it in. But uh, you know, if you don't, you don't. It's all right. You know, just get it in when you can. Uh, we'll definitely uh, appreciate it when it does come. So, and you've, and you've definitely set a bar. You have, 
your consistency has been going now for two years. So, you know, if you need to take a break, if you have something coming up, um, you, you know, you deserve a, a rest. And when the streak comes to an end, I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at, um, to see how many episodes it, uh, it goes back to. So, um, so we can get a count. Cause I'm thinking that, uh, Jeff's streak is longer than Joe DiMaggio streak, but I can't say for sure. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, and if and you think about it, it goes, go ahead. I was gonna say, as far as it goes, brother, we appreciate it. Um, we, I love, I love the fact that we we get voicemail and it's been cool that you have, you know, you have enjoyed it enough that you've, you've been so regular and sending it in. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really does. Um, we really do appreciate it. And, you know, you've been great in your feedback of, um, discovery, you know, two seasons of discovery, two seasons of lower decks, two seasons of Picard, um, and, um, one season of prodigy. And I think you'll miss the one, um, the first episode of prodigy, but you know, like I said before, <laughs> I don't host that show. So technically it's one of those, um, Roger Maris, uh, asterisks, uh, for, for that one. So, <laughs> <laughs> The streak stays alive because I don't host the show. So um, anyway, though, uh, Jeff, thank you so much. And, you know, hopefully you'll you'll get it in anyway. Um, but if you don't, you know, just get it in. I mean, hey, we haven't been good at getting our episodes out. So I can't hold you to to, uh, to task for, you know, getting in your feedback. So um, and besides, you know that if you end up sending it in after the fact, we'll play it. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, like, like I said, um, on the Facebook group, and for those of you that, uh, either don't belong to the face group, Facebook group, or you don't, uh, spend a lot of time on Facebook. Um, you know, we've moved our coverage of, um, strange new worlds ahead, uh, we'll get to Picard, but we want to stay current on Strange New Worlds, um, and I'm really hoping we can do that. And we're going to, you know, get the episodes out um, to uh, to Patreons, you know, quickly, and and you know, I, I want to try to get the episodes out to everyone uh, as quick as we can. So I'm going to try to make it a priority. Um, but, you know, certain things in my life don't uh, follow that priority. So <laughs> we'll see what happens. But, well, and that's that's the thing is that I know you guys understand that while we would love to do this for a living. Right. That, you know, we still have regular jobs and families and lives and things that take us away. So, yeah. Uh, thank you for your forbearance while we try to do our best to give you, you know, a well put together, hopefully amusing, hopefully topical and relevant podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And for that matter, everyone who's, um, you know, been thoughtful and gracious and, uh, you know, um, going through the things that I've been going through with, you know, my, um, personal life and all that moving and that, uh, it's appreciative. So I appreciate, um, the kind words and all that. And, you know, all I can do is just, uh, let you guys know that, uh, it's appreciated. Um, yeah, I was just going to respond to the fact that it has been three years since we saw, you know, um, Una, you know, number one, uh, Spock and and Pike kind of disavow uh, the the knowledge of what happened, you know, at uh, Discovery. It, you know, yep. obviously, um, I don't know. It's one of those things. It's like, do they know? Do they not know? I mean, certain things that it uh, were said, it makes it sound like they 
you know the the higher ups now know but i you know obviously they they disavow knowledge so you know it, like they they got through it because of a loophole and i i didn't say this in my yeses but i i should have um i liked that they used that uh i think that was a really kind of clever way of using the um the elements of season two of discovery in the um formation of this show so i like that and uh it it was a it was a it was a sly wink and a nod yeah and even even if everybody was sworn to secrecy and all the stuff was classified you know people are people are gonna talk and people are gonna hypothesize and ask questions and you know you'll get something like well, you know, my cousin Earl was stationed on Starbase 45, and he heard from this this uh, this Andorian who is a freighter captain that something happened, and so and so. And yeah, it's it might be classified, and it might be secret, but eventually, as we saw, you can't really open a big freaking wormhole and nobody notice. Well, you know, it makes you makes you also wonder. It's like you know, by the time um, Voyager comes, it, you know, makes you wonder. Like, oh, I remember hearing about that that the the stories about you know Discovery and how it like would go um, fifty one thousand light years and just on the power of mushrooms. <laughs> well, no, no, be a little more vague than that. Well, somebody said that they had a ship back so and so that had this special drive that would do things. <laughs> and then the other guy looks at him and says, That's just a story they told you in warp dynamics to make you ask questions. Yeah. My cellular network, that's just spores. There's no such thing. Yeah. Um, Nobody will ever go faster than warp 10. <laughs> no one will ever need more than 640K. <laughs> I always think of that. Yep. <laughs> Me too. Yep. And I immediately put the big stamp of old computer guy right yep. on the for you. Yep. <laughs> Me too. Um, now, I was curious when you said something about ham handed and forced. So, um, cause I, I don't know, I, I didn't find that either one was ham handed or forced. I think, um, given the situation, um, and knowing the history of Star Trek, as we know it, we know that, you know, supposedly there was a eugenics war. We know about there being a second civil war. And we know about there being a um, World War Three. I mean, these are things that are already, you know, part of Trek lore. So th this is not a uh, they're not reaching when they when they bring this up. Th this is right. Th this is new. I think I th and if just for me to throw my two dinar in there, I think you could take it as ham handed as to, you know, which perspective you think that the offending quarter came from. What do you mean? If you're, well, if you're going to start talking about the second civil war, I think it depends on which side of the fence you're on as to who is to blame. Mm. And I think the show took one perspective and there may be others. Hmm. Okay. Just by just by the footage they showed, that's all I'm saying. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um that, so we have some we we do have some more feedback. We do have some more feedback. James the Augmented Sailor says, I've so got my fingers crossed for this show. The first ep was amazing, and I'm cautiously optimistic that they'll be able to keep it up the entire season. Just hoping they don't make the same mistakes that I found with Picard. 
It really seems like they're going to try for a more positive message, though, with this. Though, so again, I'm excited and cautiously optimistic. Can't wait to hear everybody's thoughts. Well, so far, they seem to be overwhelmingly positive, at least within our um, within our group. I did hear someone, a um, friend of mine, that was less positive about it. She said she was underwhelmed, but uh, beyond that, um, I know Kyle said he he loved it as well, but I didn't really get we didn't really get any feedback from him, um, other than to say he loved it. Uh, and I think Ruthie loved it too, but she 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 only mentioned um, was it Anson Mount's uh, uh, giggling on. on uh, on the ready room. <laughs> yep. So, but I assume that she loved it too. Uh, Rick from Cleveland is our last bit of feedback. He says one thing that kind of came up in the Picard fi- finale too, the eugenics wars in TOS, they were, have, have taken place in the 1990s with Khan and crew shipped off in 1999 has that been retconned to still be in our future it seems that way and um i don't know it's, i mean we did have the thing that we saw in the season finale of picard um i'm not going to go into detail in case there's some people here that haven't you know seen that yet or haven't seen a period um but uh i mean it's like you said earlier you're you're talking about an old tv show that was setting things in place you know 55 you know it's 55 years in the future roughly or plus and um they're bound to run into some collisions here and you know certainly the it's not only the eugenics, but like nomad, that's another thing. And of course the inventor of nomad was the inventor of the class of, uh, ship that the, um, that Khan and his people were put on. Um, yep. You know, so, so all of that happened and none of that happened in real life. So it's like, you know, what are you going to do? The space race did not continue. Um, one show that I've started watching and I haven't, haven't finished it yet. I kind of stopped, um, but I was enjoying it from wh- what I saw was, uh, for all mankind. For all mankind. Yeah. yeah. And I really I- enjoyed, um, just the, um, thought process of, mm-hmm. you know, the, the possibilities of, you know, what that would have meant had, um, you know, the Soviets, uh, you know, gotten to the, the moon first and, uh, right. it's, it's really an interesting thought, you know, because basically the Americans got first and then they kind of said, yeah, well we won. So, you know, now we're going to settle down because essentially, you know, the Soviets couldn't really keep up, I guess is the, was what happened right. in real life, you know, but, um, in this uh in this show they not only kept up they were able to you know keep passing them so um you know and what happens in that case uh a lot you know so it, interesting to say the least uh, well to to sort of throw in my other part for what rick said in 1985 uh you know steven spielberg decided that we should use a DeLorean to make a time machine. Yes. And when they went to the far future, when was it? 2015. 2015. So in 1985, when I was a rising junior in college and just out of basic training and looking at the world, then I was going 2015. That's a long time in the future. Right. And now that we're at 2022 and then I'm a grizzled old gray man, I'm kind of going, where's my hoverboard? Yeah. Where's my hoverboard? Where's my hydrated pizza? Where's my 
um you know flying cars you know they they got exactly they got a hell of a lot of stuff wrong in in that in that movie or in that you know um tr- trilogy of movies but specifically but that's I, what happens when yeah. you speculate about the future so yeah. i would say it's perfectly reasonable for again a 50 plus year old franchise that was trying to put stuff in the future that you know things didn't quite work out like they thought Mm -hmm. but then again you had people like my you know my grandfather who was born in 1903 who got to see in his lifetime everything up from aviation to jet aviation to supersonic jet aviation from wired analog telephones to the first cell phones you know computers that took up a whole building to something that had the same equivalent power that you could put on a desk and i mean technology moves apace it's just sometimes it doesn't do everything we think it's going to do right right and this so, is something that uh you know picard said in in um in season two of Picard to, well, that's a spoiler, I guess, in a way, not a big one to Guinan. You know, he, he said something like that to her about um, how things don't progress in the way, in the time frame that we would like them to. And it's, it's true. Um, progress takes time and it usually takes longer than we think it will. You know, maybe eventually we will get flying cars, but until then, and there's every reason that we would, because, you know, we have drones now and, and drones are flying cars are just a lot smaller, you know? <laughs> yeah. So no reason to think that we couldn't get them eventually. All right. So, um, you're going to say something. I was just going to say that's, that's about it. That okay. Sometimes, sometimes we have the technology. It's just that it's not practical or scalable or right. affordable right all right um we go into our notes and uh lt do you have any notes for um things we haven't covered yet on this? i think i've pretty well said everything i need to say yeah um there are probably more spot the references here than i have listed but just I got a few things that I noticed, um, and they're not in order, but, um, we have, um, Robert April, who was, um, you know, the, has been mentioned as the first captain of the enterprise. Mm -hmm. Um, he is, uh, you know, the admiral here and, uh, in the TAS, um, as you mentioned, he was a Commodore, um, also, um, you know, they, they changed his, you know, he's, he's now black where as, uh, in the cartoon, he was a white guy, an old white guy. So, um, you know, so there's that, um, they changed also, uh, Lieutenant Kyle, I guess, or is he even a Kyle here or a Lieutenant? I guess he's a chief. So, um, but you know, also. He's not, um, you know, he was a white guy in, in, uh, TOS and he's, you know, Asian here. Oh, that's fine. Was, I don't I think he was an Australian guy. Actually, Was he Australian? Okay. Well, I remember he had an accent. Okay. Okay. Um, what else? Um, the other, um, officer, you know, the one that was next to, um, uh, who was it? Uh, next to Ortegas, her name was Lieutenant Mitchell. And, um, I only picked up on that in the captions. So mm-hmm. I'm wondering if that is to honor, uh, Kenneth Mitchell, um, by naming the character, uh, Mitchell. So, um, made me think about Gary, but, oh, it could be, it could be as well. Um, you know, it, yeah, it, it, that's a possibility as well. 
Um, we of course have the USS Archer, which uh, obviously must be uh, named after um, Jonathan Archer. And uh, we also had a shuttlecraft Stamets. And um, now I'm wondering, is this named after Paul Stamets, the, uh, you know, engineer slash scientist slash whatever he is on discovery, or is it named after the scientist slash mushroom guy in 21st century uh, earth? I'm going for the Starfleet officer. I'm thinking so too, but uh, I definitely did notice that um, and it came up on captioning. So uh, that was. Uh, and if you, mentioned. and if you recall in that scene, as soon as they said shuttlecraft Stamets, you know, Pike did cut his eyes. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, what else? Um, you know, we, we hear the Gorn. Um, as, as was already mentioned before, um, Noonien Singh, obviously referencing, you know, um, Khan, um, the, the characters that are on here that, you know, I'm not going to list them because they're, we're going to see them uh, as we go. Um, uh, uh, I'll just mention that we see, uh, Uhura is a cadet here. You know, she's a lieutenant by the time that she is um, with Kirk on the Enterprise, but she starts here as looks like a fourth year cadet um, called a, a prodigy uh, by Pike, reminding me of Tilly in that way. And I wondered if uh, if uh, she knew Tilly um, at Starfleet Academy. Um, what else now? Um, There's probably other things. Um, the um, pods were the um, were the the I don't know what you call them, but that star base, right? I, I believe that was mentioned somewhere in maybe Enterprise or t I have a vague recollection of it. I'm just th this is not me spotting a reference. This is suggesting this was mentioned before, wasn't it? <laughs> Okay. I, I don't know what does it, does it ring a bell for you? Cause it kind of rung a bell for me, but I don't know for sure if it, it did or not. Well, I know they've talked about Starfleet headquarters before and to use, to use the, the description that several of my friends do, you know, you had the sombrero stations like K seven and then you had the mushroom stations like the one you saw in Star Trek three when they oh, stole yeah, the Enterprise. Yeah, yeah. But the what we got in this was more akin to as someone previously mentioned, the uh Franz Joseph technical manual. Yes. Yes. Because it was a large central cylinder with uh like round or you know, pumpkin seed shaped pods in a ring around the central core. Now, see that that's the one thing that I was kind of surprised about. Like, uh, you know, for some reason I was thinking that Starfleet headquarters was in San Francisco. Well, Starfleet headquarters is in San Francisco, but there is a, there is a, uh, headquarters star base. Oh, okay. And that's what this was. Yeah, there's a there's a spaceport, and then you've got the you know the dirt side down port where all the admin offices are, right. and academy and that sort of thing. But somehow you've seen there have been references to the San Francisco space yards, so I always assumed that there was a geosynchronous station basically above Starfleet headquarters that had dry docks and repair facilities because there were several ships that historically were built at the San Francisco yards, as opposed to Luna or Utopia Planitia. Right. 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 Yeah. Which, you know, I've always leaned towards the UP yard 
for general general purposes but apparently luna has a facility and there's a facility earthside that is close to starfleet headquarters right right I mean, and it always made sense to me that you'd have an orbital station that was affiliated with headquarters because sure. it just the time it would take to go. If you were flying, you know, flying a shuttle, it would make more sense to have your shuttles orbital rather than have to have them climb in, climb out. Yeah. To go somewhere. Yeah. It's like a satellite, could, uh, a satellite location or yeah, because you'd you'd be well within transporter range of the station right right or like um what do you call it uh um like some head offices have like you know two headquarters right you'll have headquarters you know on on the east coast and or on the west coast so they'll have you know headquarters in you know in one country and headquarters in the other country right you know yeah like say Lenovo, uh, which is, I know in your, uh, neck of the woods, you know, they have like a headquarters in, they have a headquarters in North Carolina or is it New York? I think they've, yeah, I think they've got one out towards Raleigh in research triangle. Yeah. Cause I know IBM has got a big, got a big facility. There. Right. And then another one in, in, uh, in China, I think. So they're like dual, you know, so. All right. Well, anyway, enough of that. Um, let's move on to our um, open, not open hailing frequencies, our um, um, news, news, ratings, and info. Yeah. Our shipwide announcements. <whistles> All right. All right. So, um, of course, for that, we have uh, Wes Huntington has uh, so graciously given us our news. So here it is. I haven't even heard this yet. So <laughs> here we go. Thanks, Brian and LT. I'm Wes Huntington, one of the two co-hosts of the Twin Cities Trekkies podcast. This week's episode of the radio focused on Star Trek Strange New Worlds, which premiered that same day. Host Will Wheaton interviewed both star Anson Mount and executive producer Akiva Goldsman and talked about the journey of season one of Strange New Worlds. It was also dedicated to Picard as well, as we found out how this second season finale, entitled Farewell, was put to, put to good use, as well as the cameo of Will Wheaton himself as Wesley Crusher. There was also a sneak peek at episode two of Strange New Worlds, entitled Children of the Comet. Here's what's making news this week in the Star Trek universe for all you Talk Through Media Star Trek podcast listeners. We have lost three more members of the Star Trek family. First is David Birney. He passed away on April 27th after a lengthy battle with Alzheimer's disease, which was reported back in 2017 by his alma mater, Dartmouth College. He was 83. He's best known for playing Bernie Steinberg in the short-lived sitcom Bridget Loves Bernie, and Dr. Ben Samuels in the 1980s medical drama St. Elsewhere. However, to Star Trek fans, he is most memorable for playing a Romulan who took pot shots at Klingons across the table. He played the Romulan center Latant in the sixth season finale of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Tears of the Prophets. In a memorable scene that takes place while the Federation Alliance is preparing to attack the Dominion in the Chitoka system, Latant takes shots at the Klingons sitting across the table from him. He even enrages General Martok, played by J.G. Hertzler, by saying, Notice the primitive rage in his eye, the uncontrolled brutality. Klingons can be quite entertaining, don't you agree? Every Romulan zoo should have a pair. The next person to lose their life is two-time Star Trek The Next Generation guest actor Mike Hagerty. He passed on April 29th at the age of 67. His death was confirmed by his co-star on the HBO comedy Somebody Somewhere, Bridget Everett, who played his daughter in that show. He is perhaps best known for his role as Mr. Trigger in the sitcom Friends, as well as used clothing store owner Rudy in Seinfeld. He played two characters in Star Trek, both during The Next Generation. 
He first played the Klingon Larg in the fifth season episode, Redemption 2. In that episode, Larg and Kern, played by Tony Todd, shared a drink with each other in a bar in the capital city on Quonos. Two years later, he would play the Barconian blacksmith Scorin in season 7's Thy Known Self. He also played a bartender in the Star Trek Klingon video game, which was published by Simon & Schuster Interactive. And sadly, we've lost Star Trek Discovery guest actor Kenneth Welsh. He passed on May 5th at the age of 80. Welsh was perhaps best known for playing Wyndham Earl in Twin Peaks Season 2 in 1990. After that, he started appearing in such shows as The X-Files, Law & Order, the 1995 revival of The Outer Limits, Soul Food, The Practice, Due South, Smallville, Stargate Atlantis, Human Target, and The Expanse. However, to Star Trek fans, he did play Admiral Tenasal in the third season Star Trek Discovery episodes, People of Earth and Forget Me Not. In film, he was perhaps best known for playing the Vice President of the United States in the 2004 disaster film The Day After Tomorrow, and also played Dr. Hepburn, the father of Catherine Hepburn, the legendary film actress, in the 2004 film The Aviator, which was written by Star Trek nemesis scribe John Logan. Star Trek Picard Season 2 is over, and we have found announcements from the core cast who are not going to be returning for the third and final season, which is expected sometime in 2023. First was revealed to be Santiago Cabrera, who plays Captain Cristobal Rios. He announced on his Instagram account on Thursday when the finale did appear on Paramount Plus, saying, quote, it's been a hell of a ride. He is also the only cast member to be left out of the show as he stayed behind in the second season finale. Cabrera joined the cast of the HBO drama The Flight Attendant in September 2021, which was filming at the same time as Picard Season 3. Also on Thursday, Evan Evagora, who plays the Romulan Elnor, also announced on his Instagram that he will not be returning for the third season as well. He said, quote, I will not be back for the third season of Picard. So the quote, a mediocre band, quote, thanks for the memories. You all know the rest. L-L-A-P. Allison Pill, who went through a journey as Agnes Gerardi and then became the board queen in season two of Star Trek Picard, announced via an interview with MovieWeb.com that she will not be returning as well for season three. She said, quote, I know that season three will be the end. I was not part of season three, so I don't have much to say in terms of spoilers. I will get to watch it along with everybody else. On Friday, May 6th, Issa Briones, who appeared as Soji Asha in season one of the card and the premiere of season two, and also as Corey Sung in four episodes of this season of Picard, as well as multiple other characters in the first season of Picard, including Soji's sister, Dodge, shared photos of her time on the series on her Instagram. Her mes- message talked about her time on the series and how she was, quote, thankful for every part of this experience. She ended with, farewell, Soji. This orchid is for you. One of the surprising cameos of the season two finale of Picard was Will Wheaton himself as a traveler in the form of Wesley Crusher. His appearance did have some pan speculation that he'd be returning in the third season of Star Trek Picard, along with the rest of his castmates from Star Trek The Next Generation. However, in a lengthy blog post on his website, Wheaton confirmed twice that he will not be joining his TNG co-stars for the third season of Picard. In his blog post, he says, Wesley and Corey may blink out of existence and may never come back on camera again, or they might literally go anywhere through all space and time, from Stranger Worlds to Discovery to Lower Decks, but not to Season 3 of Picard. Sorry, nerds. I honestly don't know what comes next for them in canon, but I'd be lying if I said I haven't spent some time thinking about it. 
I may get to tell more of Wesley's story at some point. His journey over the last 25 or so years is something I've spent a lot of time thinking about as a writer or as an actor. Maybe both. But even if that never happens, if I never get to be Wesley Crusher on camera again, I will have the privilege of hosting the Revenue Room, where I get to be a Starfleet veteran, a member of the exclusive, quote, legacy Star Trek, unquote, club, and an unshamed superfan who gets to take other nerds into the room where it happens. I get to celebrate everything we all love about Star Trek and all its incarnations for my job. The Roddenberry Archive has recreated the sets from the first ever Star Trek pilot, The Cage, to celebrate the premiere of Star Trek Strange New Worlds. The Roddenberry Archive enlisted the help of two of the surviving cast and crew from The Cage, which included director Robert Butler and Sandy Gimple, who also played a Telosian. They also enlisted the help of Sean Kenny, who played the deformed Pike in the two-part episode The Menagerie, and Chris Hunter, the son of the original Captain Pike actor Jeffrey Hunter. It also includes veteran artists Mike and Denise Akuda, Doug Drexler, and Darren Docterman, who are all working with the cloud graphics company O. T-O-Y. You can find out more on their website. Season 2 of Strange New Worlds is filming right now in Toronto. And in March, Paramount Plus did surprise the fans by announcing that the Vampire Diary star Paul Wesley is taking over the iconic role of James T. Kirk in that season. They even released an image. And at the time of the announcement, Paramount confirmed that Strange New World star Anson Mount will continue to star as Captain Pike. So fans have been wondering what exactly is going on with Kirk showing up on the show. Now, showrunner Henry Alonzo Myers, who works with Akiva Goldsman on Strange New Worlds, is offering some ideas of how that could be accomplished. In short, they wanted to tell a story of this version of James T. Kirk. It will probably be a while before we get to see Paul Wesley as James T. Kirk in Season 2 of Strange New Worlds. Season 1 is currently airing on Paramount+. Plus. If you were worried that Season 3 of Star Trek Picard would be a trip down memory lane, you are sadly mistaken. Patrick Stewart recently spoke with Variety and The Hollywood Reporter and talked about the upcoming third season, which is expected sometime in 2023. He said, That is a question I can't answer, but every single one of my leading colleagues from Next Generation will be in season three at different times. Gates McFadden revealed that she is in six episodes of the upcoming third season. McFadden, along with series star Patrick Stewart, along with her co-stars, Jonathan Frakes, Marina Sirtis, Brent Spiner, LeVar Burton, and Michael Dorn, will be joining her for the third season of Picard, along with Picard stars Jerry Ryan as Seven of Nine, and Michelle Hurd as Raffaella Musiker. Twin Cities Trekkies is a weekly podcast dedicated to everything Star Trek. My podcast co-host Mackenzie Flickinger and I talk about everything from the original series all the way through Star Trek Strange New Worlds and everything in between. New episodes are released every Wednesday. You can find Twin Cities Trekkies on every platform you can think of for podcasts. Our social media handles is TC Trekkies Pod for both Facebook and Instagram. You can also reach us by emailing us at TC Trekkies Podcast at gmail.com. Or you can leave us voice messages when you find the podcast at anchor.fm slash Twin Cities Trekkies. Well, thank you so much, Wes, for your, that was a big, long news section. A lot time. of news. There was a lot of news. There's no doubt about it, especially when you're dealing with a uh, finale and a brand new show yep. on the same day. And, uh, and even like, there was even more. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. That the, the news that I heard and I just heard it in the last couple of days was that Paramount plus is going to be expanding their reach. Yes. And supposedly he will be, uh, talking about that in another, uh, news segment, but, uh, but cool. yeah, um, no, it's what well, this is, it's worth 
saying. We'll we'll have it in more detail on a Picard episode, but basically um, it's coming to, I think, the UK and Ireland in June and um, we'll be um, hitting more markets as, as they come. And it's been, you know, it's been a, an issue. Um, this, the, the thing that I don't, I mean, what I don't know is was Picard on, um, on, uh, Amazon, like it was supposed to be, because I, I remember hearing that it was supposed to be on, um, in, you know, other markets, but we never really got any like, um, international feedback from anyone so i right i wondered if you know that was in fact the case you know maybe i don't know yeah uh, you know as a as a north american continental consumer of paramount plus i haven't looked on my amazon account to see if it's there so well it's i mean it's for us it's there right right yeah. but you have to have a uh you have to have the paramount plus channel um, to get it, but supposedly, right. um, you know, like lower decks and Picard were available on, um, uh, Amazon prime in, you know, other markets, but you know, like I, I don't, I don't know. And I have not spoken to anyone. Um, I've not gotten any, you know, feedback one way or the other, if it's been available to them or not. I know that, um, you know, for some, they've had it available on like Pluto TV, which is uh, another, you know, Paramount global uh, property, right? right? But um, beyond that, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, and it's, it sucks. You know, if, if really, if it's not available to so many people right now, um, it sucks, you know, but I know that it is available to some, uh, like if you're in Latin America, if you're in Australia, um, you, you have it, if you're in like certain, um, Nordic countries, you have it, but, um, you know, beyond that, it hasn't gone wide yet, but, you know, hopefully by the end of the year, it will, um, have a, you know, wider, well, um, I remember something coming out when we were doing lower decks Yeah, that there were people in the EU that weren't getting it yet. Yeah. But I assume that Paramount is taking steps to broaden their market share. So hopefully everybody can be up to date and get it when we get it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Hopefully they will get it. But uh, one thing, it, it is definitely growing. Um, there was a uh, news that came out last week that um, Paramount Plus has increased um, to its um, subscription base in the first quarter, uh, 6.8 million uh, new subscriptions to 40 million. And I'm not sure if that is a... Um, us number or if that is global but it is um you know like uh, netflix for example is supposedly shrinking um and uh paramount plus is one of the one of the ones that seems to be growing quite a bit um which makes sense you know the we it's not just the star trek stuff i think it's doing well with halo and, um, you know, having another science fiction, um, show like this, you know, something that's, um, compatible with Star Trek, I think is a good thing too. Um, but it's also, you know, got a lot of other, um, programs going on too, Westerns and, and, um, just all sorts of stuff. So it's good to see that, um, you know, the, the, the services, uh, expanding. I, I really wish, I still wish that they would combine um showtime um the showtime network or not network but the showtime service and and um and paramount plus because to me 
like if they made it like say um hbo max is right which would be a similar kind of thing um to me that would that would bring in even more people but instead i think they have some shows that are from showtime but they it's more like a sampling or or something or they have older shows to me though right i i think that they would uh benefit from that but anyway i think that's it for um this episode so um all right to submit your theories and feedback go to talkthroughmedia.com forward slash feedback where you can submit text or audio we had a problem with the uh form earlier this week um where it wasn't allowing uh strange new worlds feedback to go through uh but that's been fixed now so that that uh that will go through and um there'll be by the time this comes out there'll be a, a separate uh separate feed for um strange new worlds it won't be you won't be able to find it on uh, um apple Podcasts or whatever but it'll slowly come out there you can find it on the website um anyway you can call 216-232-6146 to leave a voicemail uh as well and you can Email us. The uh, email for Strange New Worlds is strange new worlds at talkthroughmedia.com. You can post in our designated episode thread in our Facebook group. That's at facebook.com slash groups slash Star Trek TTM podcasts. And you can tweet us and Instagram us, which is at Star Trek TTM. If you would like to support the podcast, you can like our page on Facebook. That's at facebook.com slash talk through media. And while you're there, write us a review. You can share us on Facebook and retweet us on Twitter, especially when we post the new episodes out. You can subscribe to the talk through media YouTube channel, which is where you'll find our newest episodes. First subscribe to us in Apple podcast or the podcast client of your choice. And while you're there, give us a rating or review. You can also go to podchaser.com where you can rate and review the podcast and individual episodes. Finally, the best way to help us keep the lights on is support us via Patreon. Now, we'd like to thank our Patreon supporters, Andrew Davis, Morning Pace, Trey Mike, Robert Kaiser, Jeff Gentry, Kevin Lyle, Michael Carrier, Aaron Mays, Brian Shiro, Kim Vogley, Kyle McAdams, James Robbins, and me, <laughs> Lord Stodd. Yes, and thank all of you for your support. Um, it helps to pay the bills for hosting, for software that we use to, um, there's a, a, well, it's a website called Auphonic that we use to make the podcast sound so nice. Um, and um, hosting, uh, media hosting, all those various things that uh, we need to uh, pay the bills. All of the podcasts from the Talk Through Media um, network can be found on the Talk Through Media All Inclusive feed, which includes this podcast, the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast, the Star Trek Discovery podcast, the Star Trek Picard cast, the Star Trek Lower Decks podcast, the uh, Star Trek Prodigy by Rebinge It, The Walking Dead Talk Through, The Fear of the Walking Dead Talk Through, and anything else that we ever do. <laughs> and this is uh, one thing that's on the, our, our notes here is wrong, but uh, Kyle, LT, and me are continuing the uh, Fear of the Walking Dead Talk Through. Uh, we just recorded last week the um was it season seven episode 11 mm -hmm. um what was the name of that episode don't remember but uh we i'm still i'm still hung on morning cloak oh yeah morning but i think cloak. that was the one before yes morning cloak not to be confused with morning pace so um no relation uh, <laughs> the um yeah so uh, 
we will be covering tomorrow, uh, recording tomorrow, season seven, episode 12. And uh, I will be on that. I'm going to um, try to stay current on that. I've actually seen uh, ahead because I have AMC Plus and I've uh, already seen episode 13. So um, the I think the episode that we'll be co- talking about tomorrow is the Sunny Boy. Sunny Boy. That's right. That's right. I've seen I've seen Sunny Boy and I've seen the Raft. So that's the next one. Uh, the next episode of Star Trek Strange New Worlds that we'll be covering on the Strange New Worlds talk through is season one, episode two, titled Children of the Comet. It is written by the other co-showrunner, Henry Alonzo Myers, and with an ampersand, Sarah Tarkoff, and it is directed by Maya Vervillo, who has directed several episodes of Star Trek Discovery, and I believe Picard in season one anyway, and um, don't have a description of it, but um, until next time, I'm Brian. And I'm LT. Peace and long life. Live long and prosper. All right. Kapla. Kapla.